our, our panel begins with uh, Professor Robert Van Vorst, who was a professor for many years at Western Theological Seminary. And uh, he will start off, and we'll hear from Diane Mitsu-Pitzer, who's a member of the Religious Studies Program at Grand Valley State University. And then finally, Shel Comperl, who is a professor emeritus in Religious Studies, and I'm sure is gonna pick up on some of the hints that Elaine gave us uh, about the Jewish mysticism. So we'll ask each of them to make a few comments, and then uh, Elaine Pagels will respond. Well, thank you, Doug, and thank you especially to Dr. Pagels for being here and for uh, regaling us with this very important topic. I was looking through the almost current issue of the Atlantic Magazine, this is July, and in their big question feature, the big question for the summer was, what lost treasure would you most like to find? Far and away was the whole library of Alexandria would be quite a find. The third one was Genghis Khan's treasure. The fourth one was Vermeer's painting the concert. But the second winner was literally a fifth gospel. Yeah, isn't that interesting? That the American public is, is still thirsting for uh, gospel input and information. And I think what they say when they reply a fifth gospel, it means that something along the lines of the first four and something to supplement it. So just quite interesting that this is not just an academic topic or a church topic, but the American public as a whole is interested in it. Of course, some people talking about the rise of biblical illiteracy would may tend to say, well, they should know the first four better before they go on to number five. But uh, at any rate, so yeah. Uh, the importance, I think, of this for academic work is very high. Uh, it's, uh, I'm, I'm glad that Professor Pagels uh, used the word suggest, right? What does the teaching in these Gospels suggest about uh, Jesus of Nazareth? And uh, this suggest is something that uh, we should work on, uh, a lot of hypotheses, a lot of good things. So it's, uh, it's an important thing to consider. And also, I think it's important for people to look at the confessional perspectives. Uh, in Nag Hammadi, as uh, has been said, uh, these treasures were found, the Nag Hammadi books, in a monk's grave in a jar put in that grave. Did the monk try to take it with him? I don't know. Um, scholars got it instead. So, and. The big question for us confessionally, I think, for us today, which Professor Pagels raised, and perhaps we may want to get into this more, is how did uh, Christians read it in the past? Uh, there was controversy. Some people said, don't read it at all. Other church leaders said, uh, read it only uh, privately. It's not good for public teaching or public reading. But uh, this is a question, I think, that's still open for us. We may not read it in a lot of churches. Well, we may occasionally find the Gospel of Thomas referred to in church. It has found its way into a couple of Christian hymns in standard uh, hymn books. So this is a question we should examine as confessionally important. Is it uh, readable? Uh, how should it be read? And why? Again, I am delighted to be a part of this panel and to be in the presence of Dr. Pagel, so thank you. As somebody who teaches at a university but had a prior life as a parish clergy, I think about these texts and I think about how they impact the readers and the livers the livers, the, those who live the word as it is given to us. One of the things I know from the classroom is that my students often come into a class at a public university, a course either on sacred texts or on Christianity, thinking that the canon was plopped down into their laps as is. And so we actually spend time with your work talking about the development of the canon and why things made it in and why things did not. 
And I think that's stunning for students to wrestle with that. But then you think about how that impacts how we use the text in the modern era when the church is so fractured. And we all have canons within a canon, those things we hold as absolute truth in the Gospels and in the epistles and beyond, and those that we aren't quite as sure really mean what they say. And it's a difficult wrestling in the modern age. And as the church wrestles with whether or not to divide or to stay together in various denominations, including my own, as the church decides, is this really what we believe is true 2,000 years later? It is interesting to come back to the Gospel of Thomas and say, hmm, how, would, how, would, how might it have been different had this been in and not excluded? But the question, or the, the fact or point you made that I find the most intriguing in, of the last hour is Athanasius saying, get rid of those books that you like so much. And you wonder what's behind. It's not get rid of those books that are uh, heretical, although they were considered to be heretical, but why the ones that you like so much? What does that say to us in the modern era? Let me be the third to join in thanking you for coming, and what a pleasure and honor it is for me to be able to respond. I'm responding in terms of being a member of the Jewish community here in Grand Rapids who has always enjoyed reading and studying sacred texts of other religions as well. And I think if nothing else, what you have accomplished by your presence here today is to make it very obvious that in interfaith gatherings and even within our own communities, it is vital in order to understand our own religion and to understand other religions, to look at all of these writings, not just the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible canon, and the New Testament, but all of the writings, whether they're the Apocrypha, the Pseudepigrapha, or some of these that are very much like the Gnostic Gospels, the writings that were off limits for Jews as well. And you've given some allusions to some of these things very nicely. Just like to point out, well, I can't resist a quick comment that when I was on sabbatical uh, about 12, 13 years ago to Arizona State, I was in a seminar where we had students and faculty, and we were talking about the Gnostic Gospels and the discovery, and one of the students pipes up, oh, that sounds like the Christian Dead Sea Scrolls. So that was a... What do they have in common? Oh yeah, they were found in jars in a wilderness and around the same time. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's sort of the level of understanding back then. But you had mentioned a couple of things. First of all is probably Judaism's among Jews least memorable philosopher, Philo Judaeus of Alexandria, a person in my rather extensive upbringing in the Jewish um, conservative congregation in Cleveland and some other learning. His name was mentioned, but nobody ever talked about it. And it's too bad in the sense that he is probably far better known among Christian scholars than he is among Jewish scholars. And that really is too bad. Why was he um, placed on the shelf of thou shalt not read among the Jews because the rabbis of the Talmud who were sort of the Irenaeus of their day said no Greek wisdom because Greek wisdom was thought to be suspect and so the Apocrypha was never included in the Jewish canon because the documents had been written in Greek 
even though there may have been Hebrew originals or Aramaic originals, nothing. So Philo needs some rehabilitation among the Jewish community. Um, I could go, maybe I'll get a chance to go into more detail later on, but he was extremely important because of his allegorical interpretations of scripture and a number of other things. And he is regarded by most scholars as one of the leading influences on Valentinius, who was responsible for one of the gospels you wrote about but didn't have a chance to mention today yet is the gospel of truth. So very important figure. Ironically, a PhD dissertation by a Finnish scholar was just written a couple years ago dealing with Philo and Valentinius. So a good topic. Yeah, at the University of Helsinki, I have the reference, certainly. Um, the other thing is the secret documents. You mentioned the Jewish mysticism, Kabbalah. Kabbalah comes from a Hebrew word meaning to receive. It's the received mystical tradition. And just as you pointed out, every religion has its own mystic um, slant to it. Same with Judaism. This was something else that was forbidden. The rabbis of the Talmud talked about not being able to ask certain questions, what is above, what is below, what came before, and what will come after. And one of the things that, um, one of the stories in the Talmud that I don't have time to get into now, talks about the rabbis who tried to answer the question, what is above? And these writings that were about contemporaneous with the Talmud dealt with those kinds of questions, what is above? Because if we knew what was above, we'd be able to find out the secrets of God. Theosophy was the fancy word for that, the study of God. And we might be able to manipulate God if we knew how to learn these secrets. So there was a whole literature dating way back to the second century, if not earlier, called the Maase Markava, the works of the chariot. The chariot alluding to, as you showed those nice diagrams, about Ezekiel, chapter one, the throne of God, the kavod, the glory of God. The concept of the kavod is extremely important in rabbinical teachings and in the mysticism. So there's lots to consider that you introduced from a Jewish perspective, and I'm very anxious both in the session here and in our own communities to see how far we can get with bringing in the connections. Okay, thank you. No. That's not working. Thank you so much. These are wonderful comments. And I'll just make a really short one because I've talked a lot, and I'd rather hear from many more people here. First, the question of the Gospel of Thomas. You asked the question, Bob, is it readable, the Gospel of Thomas? And you know, when I show it to students, <clears throat> I'd say, it depends on the reader. Half of them say, I love it. And half of them say, I don't, what? What? What's that about? And it, it takes a certain kind of experience. I think, See, I mentioned William James because it's talking about religious experience. And I thought, to me, it feels like Emily Dickinson's poems. If you have the experience she's talking about, the poem is just, it's just heart-wrenching. Just But if you don't, what? It's just oblique. And so it really, these are not as readable as Mark. They're not as readable as Matthew or Luke. And that's, a, that's a, a reason they weren't included. But also, you know, you asked Diane about why certain things made it in. Again, I, I wanted to say maybe the Gospel of Thomas isn't suitable for a canon. Because if this is what you're supposed to read in church, it's one thing to read a story about Jesus talking to a woman by the well. It's another thing to have these aphoristic sayings if you bring forth what is within you, huh, what? 
Some people will say, oh, <laughs> and some people say, what? So, it, you know, these things probably require a certain level of, of exploration, um, of curiosity, and I'll quote my favorite theologian, James Cone, and say imagination. Because if you asked him what theology was about, he'd say imagination. What else could it be about? Um, but if it speaks to our experience. Also, the great thing about a canon, and, and you talked about the diversity of the way people interpret. Yeah, I think you've got all these different books to choose from. You've got the Epistle of James in Christian tradition. You have Paul. And, and that can give rise to everything from Pentecostalism to Russian Orthodoxy to Christian science to, you know, you name it, Baptists and Methodists and Presbyterians and all, everybody else. Because a canon can only survive, I think, if you have enough stuff that's different, that different people in different circumstances can engage. I, anyway, I think it's useful to have that. You talk about the, the 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 rabbis being the Irenaeus of their day. Is it is it Hagiga two four? Is there's a certain passage that says, you know, you shall not talk about what is above, what is below, you know, what is above the firmament and you know, beyond the universe or underneath it or before it, and and Irenaeus says exactly that in exactly the same time. The second century is when the rabbis are saying that that that. Hagiga, is, isn't it? Uh, that passage is just at the time Irenaeus is saying, no, <laughs> you're not supposed to do that. You can't ask those questions. Humans weren't meant to know that. And, and um, that's fascinating stuff. Anyway, thank you. I'd like to just open it up. As long as I'm the next one, your question was just, the interesting thing is that the rabbis, while they said no, 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 they did quote a number of passages from the wisdom of Ben Sirah, which was a perfect example of this Greek wisdom. So there wasn't a total consistency on their part. In fact, the Talmud is full of inherently contradictory materials, and that's part of the glory of it. Because according to the ideas supported by and introduced by the rabbis themselves, you are supposed to debate and discuss and argue. And the Talmud is a wonderful document because it brings out the majority votes, the minority votes, all the debates. And in half of the issues they bring up, well, maybe not statistically half, but in many of them, the answer to what the solution to the problem is, when the Messiah comes, he'll tell us. So that's it. The other panelists want to respond, and then we'll open it up. Sure. I, one of the other interesting things as I listen to you and reflect on the Gospel of Thomas in particular is some of what he talks about there regarding having the light within and pulling that out are areas that in the modern era we're seeing through things like mindfulness or th there's a whole host of, of realities that we practice now. And I think for those of us who have been raised in, tradi in the tradition, parts of the tradition that say, no, it's not within you, it is external to you, the conflict even though on a feeling level you know that you are experiencing the divine in a greater way by these practices, it's almost as if you have to go through mental gymnastics to allow yourself the, the grace or the space to explore practices that maybe Thomas was already writing about or thinking about or encouraging. But in, in those early years of Christianity, as they're trying to make it all kind of more homogenous in its outlook and in its practice, uh, things got lost. Things were lost that were coming from the 
outside world, and now we have to figure out how we're going to integrate them back into the reality of what is healthy for us as practitioners of the faith. And I think that one of the important questions for uh, the study of Gnosticism and for interreligious uh, interfaith affairs is the likely origin of Gnosticism in mystical Judaism. Um, I've always been sort of mystified by that myself of uh, how can this appear from the margins of Judaism, heterodox Judaism, whatever. It's, it's challenging. We don't have sort of writings or traditions, many of them from the times that would enable us to answer that. The Kabbalah comes a thousand years later, at least it's written for him. So it's, it's challenging, but very important, I think, for interreligious affairs and just for understanding where these gospels and this movement comes from. I, I'd like to comment about that because um, when I was on the plane, I had a lot of time. <laughs> and I read, I was reading a book about... Um, Jewish wisdom tradition, and I was thinking of the Gospel of Thomas. I said, "Is it like Pirkei which is just a list of the sayings of the fathers, or Ben Sira, which is just a list the sayings of Jesus Ben Sira? Okay, sayings of Jesus of Nazareth, right? Um, but it says different things, you know. And yet, wisdom tradition, as one of my colleagues at the at Tel Aviv points out, is is not a single kind of genre or anything. There's different kinds. There's all kinds, and so I'm very interested in following that up. But my colleague, Peter Schaefer, you know his work? Yeah. Peter, Peter's a brilliant scholar of, of, of Jewish, um, so well, he does a lot of fourth century, yeah, his, the, 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 the chariot. Yeah, his best known work, at least the one I found most interesting, was a book length monograph on Jesus and the Talmud. Yes. Well, he invited me to speak about the Gospel of Thomas in Berlin. And as it happens, um, I wasn't able to go and give the lecture I'd hoped to give. But the reason he invited me to speak, and there were all these scholars from Austria and Germany, and they've written a lot about the Gospel of Thomas. I have monographs, one from Simon Gathercole at Cambridge and another Ulrich Plisch at, at, in, in, in Germany and another one from another German scholar. I swear 700 to 1,000 pages each, right, on a 17-page text. <laughs> and what they don't ever mention is Genesis. And I, I, they don't see that this is Midrash on Genesis. When I was reading the Gospel of Thomas, it was really when I was writing the book Beyond Belief, I finally said, this is about Genesis. This is a this is mystical interpretation of Genesis. Genesis 1-3 about the, the divine light, about the creation of Adam, about the images within the human. It's not a Christian text necessarily in the sense that Jesus wasn't a Christian. Um, this, is a, this is a reading of Genesis. So I, I asked one of our most brilliant graduate students who's a rabbi, um, Ari, what is this text about? He said, oh, it's about Genesis. I said, yeah. But Peter knew, and he, he's, he was, he's been the head of the Jewish Museum in Berlin, um, then criticized for, for, because he's not Jewish by birth, uh, that he's maybe not Jewish enough. It, these things have gotten so terribly, painfully aggravated again, particularly in Europe, but also here. And he, he knew that if I spoke to these scholars in Germany, they did not recognize Jewish sources when they saw them. They simply, and I, I said to myself, they've repressed Jewish scholarship. They have, a lot of them. They just are unaware of it. And they don't know about the, the, the learning about the Bible that is deeply part of Talmudic and Midrashic um, study, you know? and and. Anywhere at Harvard, at Yale, other places I know, it's totally, study of Judaism does not include the study of Christianity and vice versa. Princeton is the only place that I know where our scholars who study, come to study Judaism, our graduate students, I mean, they have to learn Greek and they have to take my course <laughs> on early Christian sources. And all of the people who come to study Christianity have to take, um, Muli Vitas's class uh, on 
on Midrash. They have to study with uh, Martha Himmelfarb on Hebrew Bible. Uh, they have to learn Hebrew. And finally, we're having a dialogue, a real dialogue. But it, it never happened because the scholarship was completely separate when I was in graduate school. And I hope that's changing, finally. It is sort of ironic that our temple librarian, I was working with her just yesterday, this Temple Emanuel in Grand Rapids, and we were looking through our collection to find a book on Philo, because that was in my mind because of this talk, and the only books that we could find that were of high quality were written by Christian scholars. Not yeah. So, no, which, go ahead. My colleague at the Hebrew University is re re really writing beautiful work on Philo. Why am I forgetting her name? I'll get it. Sure. But she's, she's writing now about Philo in a way, and it's very much a subject of discussion at the Hebrew University. Good, there is hope then. <laughs> No, because I even went to the um, uh, detailed bibliography of all the academic books, and I just went through all of the biographies of the authors and couldn't find more than one or two who were Jewish, and those are outdated. So I'm well, I'll, I'll get you her name. I'm just, uh, I'll, have no, to, that's fine. I'll have to check it. Fine. Any other well, comments from the panel? In our... Torah cycle last week, or th this is the week we're studying Bereshit, the first six, ch uh, first five chapters of Genesis, and the concept of that primordial light that was there before. One Jewish tradition says seven things were cr create. I'm sorry, ten were created before the creation, and the, among the three were the primordial lights. So even before. God said, Yehi or, let there be light on day one. There was another kind of light. Number two is wisdom. That's Proverbs chapter eight. Shabbat, the Sabbath, even before the seventh day, and the Torah, of yeah. course. So there's lots of interesting connections here. And much of what you said, including the idea of the two, the human being being divided and leading to all sorts of problems as part of our midrashim as well. Okay, I know there are a lot of questions in the earlier session, so we're opening up the mics for your questions uh, to the, any of the panelists uh, and, the, and Dr. Pagels as well as the panelists will feel free to respond to the questions as they come up. Thank you for being here, really appreciate it. I've been a fan of your work for a long time. Um, one of the things uh, that <laughs> I kept thinking of when uh, one of the gentlemen referred to uh, Irenaeus as the cranky pants, I thought that <laughs> Mr. Cranky Pants, don't want to get that away. Yes, right. I, <laughs> I appreciated that a lot. Also appreciated the fact that I believe it's Irenaeus who said that the glory of God is a human life fully lived, which we can't, we can't forget that side of him either. Um, but one of the things that this whole talk made me think of was uh, the concept of theosis yes. and the, uh, the idea that uh, our Eastern Orthodox brethren uh, hold very dear and is very well developed in that part of the Christian world, but not by Western Christianity. Will you address that? Oh, yeah, that's a very important point that there, well, you can't say there isn't Christian mysticism because you can look at John of the Cross, Teresa of Avila, um, you know, others, there are the great, and fathers? pardon me? The desert mothers and fathers? Yes, there definitely have been, well, that was before, yeah. Th there are Christian mystics. Interestingly, John of the Cross and Teresa of Avila, we were just talking about that with a colleague from Israel, uh, were both from Jewish families. They both were, their grandfathers were Jewish. They were conversos, converted under pressure in Spain, right? And they became the two greatest saints of the Catholic Church. I love that. Um, <laughs> but Teresa, when she felt that she was in, in close connection with God, and when St. John of the Cross wrote his beautiful Dark Night of the Soul, uh, from the Song of Songs, they always had to, 
Teresa particularly had to say, oh, miserable worm that I am, you know. That is, she, she always had to say that she was worthless because she thought that she might be misinterpreted if she spoke about union with the divine. So as one of my mentors said, actually Theodore Gaster at, at, at Barnard, he said, the Jewish mystic can say, I and thou, but can never say, tatvam asi, is that correct? Thou art that. That is, you are that divine, right? You can't say that. But these texts do say that, and they talk about the human in continuity with the divine, and that's what theosis means, is becoming like the divine, right? And though, but it is, as just as you say, Orthodox Christians, Coptic, Ethiopic, Greek, Russian, Armenian, you know, you name it, they have those esoteric traditions, and they maintain them in a way that people who come out of the Roman Catholic, out of Catholic tradition and Protestant tradition usually don't. Except some people, we were just talking about some people rediscovering it. I think George Fox, the founder of the Quaker movement, when he rejected Catholic and Protestant Christianity, he said, I don't have to go to seminary. God illuminated me. He sent me the inner light. And as someone here has just said, if you think you got the inner light, you can say some pretty crazy things that can you can go off the deep end. And that's true. But I think George Fox got it pretty right in many ways. Founder of the Quaker movement, his pacifism, his his conviction about even Native Americans, even black people had the inner light. Amazing, right? Well, that's what that's what he spoke about in a time when other Christians didn't. So anyway. Okay, I'll take a question over here. Thank you. Um, my question actually has to do with that union of the divine, because before we were talking about that male and female. Yes. And is that what the Gospel of Thomas is talking about when he says that Mary Magdalene should become male? Would it work the opposite, that Peter has to become female? So is it like the goal um, was the goal of the writers to show us that that divine light is neither male nor female, but the light wouldn't, would he have to encompass both of them to get to the light? That's so. a really good question. And there's a book about Philo um, by Bayer about saying, well, if you talk about both genders in one, is it androgynous or is it non-gendered? And he said, in some ways, in Greek, it's kind of, it, you, you almost can't tell the difference um, whether both genders are in, you know, when the, when, when, when the male is not male and the female is not male and the two are one and the same, it, it's about, in any case, the, the rejection of division on the basis of gender. However, as many people point out, well, it's still in these cultures, just as in Buddhism, it's better to be male. <laughs> these traditions are developed primarily, as you know, by men. And it's not a surprise that it's much better to be male than female. And it's higher and it's more spiritual and all of that. So there is that built into the language. Mm -hmm. And into this language, too, in the Gospel of Thomas. But I think the idea is that, you know, that neither that Mary has to recognize that she's not a female as opposed to a male, rather that gender is not the identity, that the identity is one that goes, that transcends gender. That's my understanding of it. But thank right. you, good question. Well, that leads right side. into my question. <laughs> uh, there is, uh, there's a, um, Biblical uh, scholar at the Sh uh, Catholic uh, uh, Institute of uh, Theology, uh, Barbara Reed, who's from this community, and she's she's putting together uh, a series called Wisdom Commentary, where she's assembled a group of biblical feminist biblical scholars to do commentary on every book of the Bible. Okay. And so, uh, you know, it's, it's very scholarly and dense work. Uh, and I wonder if you think that uh, 
having that feminist hermeneutic uh, is, is going to change the picture that we have? I think it has. Of course it has. Um, I think the presence of Elizabeth Fiorenza at Harvard and, um, and many other scholars, um, Phyllis Tribble, and having women actually thinking about these things when, when, when my book was published, one of my mentors wrote in, in the, he was at Oxford, in the London Times, you know, well, you know, women are, women are very susceptible to heresy, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, and this is true, because this has to do with intuition, mm -hmm. which sometimes, I don't want to make gender dichotomies here, but sometimes women have been more tuned into certain aspects of language that that are compatible with these sources it just seems to me but i think it's changed it's changing dramatically mm. i'm glad that's happening yeah thank you <coughs> i hope i can <coughs> articulate this i'm not i'm not a scient uh, as much of a scientist as you are obviously but so my limited knowledge of quantum physics um, i understand I believe that the teaching is that there's an underlying energy in the universe that's interlinked and throughout, and you know, panentheism is sort of explains God better than anything to me. That he, he and he, she, it is within and above both. Um, and with that understanding, can you touch on the Gnostics, um, the Gnostic books? explanation of the light in that regard and also does do those books speak to in that context the soul uh, and and keeping consciousness after the physical body dies and was there consciousness prior to the physical body um, being born I hope that's clear. I'm not sure it is to me, even. <laughs> well, y there are a lot of questions in that, but I think the suggestion, as I read the Gospel of Thomas, um, is that, it, well, it speaks about coming from the light and going to the light. You came from that, you go back to that. Now, what that means about individual consciousness is not articulated, um, but there is a sense of, of some divine source of divine, that the universe is somehow um, a, a, uh, a flowing out of divine energy in some ways. And the, you know, one of the, one of the texts talks about, it sounds very Buddhist, but that God breathes out the universe and then he, he inhales and it goes back into him. I mean, Origen talks about that, one of the early Christian fathers that I work on. So that is, that's a perception that, that does definitely occur. So I want to just take a little break here. Does any of the other panelists have things they want to add? If I could just make one comment in response to the feminist um, biblical commentaries, I've actually, I'm re in the process of reading the one in that series, Wisdom Series on Judges which is a very interesting book because of the treatment of women and actually the presence of women in chapters four and five, Deborah and Yael, and on the other end, the treatment of Jephthah's daughter and the concubine of Gibeah. And it's fascinating the way that the editor has weaved together an interesting discussion of both the text presumably written by men, and from a feminist point of view, how these characters are misportrayed and what's probably going on through their minds. So if people interested in feminist biblical commentary, that's a wonderful and really up-to-date series from the limited thing part that I've read. And, the, and those passages are rarely preached in Christian churches. <laughs> <laughs> Jewish, too. Question over here. Yes, yeah, so this question is for the panel. Dr. Bagel, first of all, thank you for your work. Um, I'm going to start with a Deepak Chopra quote. Religion is understanding somebody else's story. 
Spirituality is understanding your own. And for me, for my own personal journey, and I lead an interfaith contemplative group, we know that 30% of the population is spiritual but not religious, and this is a very growing factor. One person talked about quantum mechanics. Um, to me, the contemplative life is probably doesn't get as much um, discussion as it should. And so the, kind of my question for the group is, and I believe we all have a unique love language with the divine. Some of us prefer intellectual ascent. Some of us prefer experiences. So for the panel, my question really is less around the intellectual ascent, because I think that tends to divide us. I guess my question for the panel is, which spiritual practices do you have in your daily life that help you connect with the divine? Well, I think for myself, prayer and meditation are very important, uh, sometimes the two together. If people knew the way that I pray, they might be uh, sort of shocked by it, but sometimes, like, I pray myself to sleep and other practices, too, but uh, that is important for me, uh, both intellectually and emotionally. I think it's important to keep those at least connected in some way. I practice both traditional prayer, but also I am very much a part of uh, a mindfulness uh, group and practice mindfulness very regularly. For me, much of the discipline comes when I am walking our 65-pound dog in the nature center near our house, and there is a sense of being very much one with the universe and one with him when I'm in control. When he's in control, it's a whole other story. But um, there, for me, it is that along with reading and reading broadly in uh, people who have written on spirituality as well as the sacred text. That's part of my own tradition. Usually the first thing I do when I get up in the morning after I'm sort of dressed and my eyes are opening is to look at some passage from one of the rabbinic texts, either the Talmud or the Midrash or the um, one of the law codes. And I usually try to do that for about half an hour till I feel I'm more awake. And then some point during the day, I try to recite in my own mind, preferably when I'm outside and enjoying nature, which will be more difficult the next six months than it's been the last six, but I try to recite in my own mind, there are five psalms that are particularly meaningful to me, as well as certain prayers from the traditional Jewish morning and evening services, depending on the time of day. Yes, that's a good question. Um, I would say for me, uh, music, uh, I really find... Um, when I first went to Princeton, I thought I might go to the Quaker Meeting House. This is a one established in 1725. I, I like the Quaker practice, but they talk too much. <laughs> <laughs> the Holy Spirit was very active there, um, and there was it wasn't it wasn't that. And also there was no music, and so I I go now when I go to the Episcopal Church where the music is amazing. You just walk in, and it's that ancient ritual um, is designed to open you up. It's based on the, the, the Hebrew liturgy. It's designed to open you up emotionally. And the music is just uh, extraordinarily powerful. Um, that means a lot. W sometimes, as you know, if you re read my book, I, I would go to the uh, a monastery in Snowmass run by Cistercian Trappist Catholic monks because they were, they taught me a lot about silence and practice. And then there's yoga and being outdoors. So. And the work, actually. I find the work that working on these texts, um, as I wrote, it works on me. And, and that's another form. This evening we're going to hear a lot more about how 
Dr. Pagel's life has informed her scholarship and how her scholarship has informed the various issues she's faced in, a, in her life. If you know her book, uh, you'll be very inspired. You are, have been very inspired. Uh, we do have copies of her books for sale, the Gnostic Gospels, and then also her personal story, Why Religion. It's been a very excellent afternoon, long afternoon. I want to thank you all for coming, and we hope to see you at 7 o'clock later this evening. Thank you very much.